What's going on? It's Anthony Wofford again here with How to Get Into Drama School. We are having a conversation today with my Juilliard friend, Gavi Greer. We will talk with her about how she got into drama school. Bottom line, she has an amazing story. She made me crack up. Um, so you got to get uh, notes out, get your friends around, share this podcast, whatever you got to do. Um, keep your mindset strong about drama school this year. This is a great resource to do it. And she was on the phone. She was actually in Northern California. So I recorded her on speakerphone. So hopefully you guys can hear her and enjoy. So Gavi, so happy you're here with me um, sharing about drama school. Um, You have an interesting story. You have a unique story. Uh, Tell us a little bit about like where you were before you were uh, auditioning your education and how you decided to audition. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was a I did a regular undergraduate degree. I have a BA in English literature um, from Barnard College, and um, I always knew that I loved acting. I would always like you know wanted to be acting full time. Um, but I come from like a super academic family, so uh, the idea of not having a regular BA was just like not an option <laughs> in my house. So, um, so yeah, so I definitely went and did like a regular BA and I was really lucky because, um, so Barnard is the Women's College of Columbia University in New York City and we actually, there, there are a lot of faculty who we share in the drama department there with Juilliard. So, um, I was really, really fortunate in that I actually got to work with, um, Becky Guy, who's, um, at least when I was at Juilliard, she was, uh, head of second year acting. Um, she directed me in, in two plays at Barnard, and then I also took, like, her checkoff class, and I got to work with her a bunch, and then I also got to work with, um, someone named Ralph Vito, who was the head of, uh, Voice and Speech at Juilliard for many, many years. Um, he's no longer there, uh, but he... He worked, so I got to, I got to learn Shakespeare from him um, in a class uh, before applying. So um, I, it was really, really fortunate that I got to sort of have exposure to them, and I, I had a, a real sense of what the training at Juilliard was going to be like because I had worked very directly with these people. That's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. So yes. I know um, Becky still works at Bard, and um, Ralph is now the head of drama at Syracuse, which is great. Um, yeah. And so you're saying the key to getting into Juilliard is work with the teachers. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The the key to getting into Juilliard is great quality work. But, yeah, I see what you're saying where you actually got, like, high-quality training even before you auditioned for um, Juilliard. Definitely. And I I have to say, like – I, I don't think you have to have, like, worked with these particular people. I mean, that, that was just a, a, a lucky thing because, I mean, so, so I'll tell you, the first time I applied to Juilliard, uh, I, so I got called back, but I did not get in. Um, so oh, even, great. Even or, I didn't know that. Worked with these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got in the second time I applied. Um, and um, so, so, so even though I had worked with these people, it was not um, like, oh, great, we know her, she's just in. Like, it, it, was, it was definitely... Um, so, so I, what I remember really specifically actually about my callback the first time I applied um, when I did not get in was that, um, like, I had worked really hard on my monologues and, I, you know, my first round audition had gone really well. And, um, and then I go into my callback and I think I was just so nervous because I didn't know what to expect. I had no, it was, like, totally, like, new, uncharted territory. I also uh, auditioned in New York City, so for that initial callback, you're actually in front of the entire faculty. That's not true if you audition in Chicago or San Francisco, but um, I think I just got really overwhelmed, um, and, and uh, going from, like, an audition with three people to suddenly there's, like, 20 people or however many people are on the faculty. Um, <laughs> and um, so, so I remember having this feeling, like, in the callback of, like, just get through this. Like, I think that was, like, the recording that was playing in my head. <laughs> over and over. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, totally. Which is just, like, not helpful at all. <laughs> and, um, and so I remember, actually, in the, the, the second time I auditioned, um, one of the things that was really awesome about the audition to Juilliard is they have, um, especially with the audition in New York City, is they have all these students who are there, like, hanging out with you and talking to you about the program and talking to you about what to expect in the audition room and sharing crazy stories and, you know, all kinds of stuff with you. 
And one of the, the people, like the room monitors, who was a student, was just sort of like, whatever you do in this, in this callback, whatever you do, just stay present. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, okay, okay, like that's, that's what I need to do. Like whatever, whatever happens, the, mo- the monologue going through my head should not be just get through this. The monologue should be stay present. What are they asking me to do? And how do I, how do I just like do what they are asking and, and really, and don't check out. Like no part of me should be checking out. Totally. And I really think that was, um, was really key <laughs> for, for getting in the That's great time. advice. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, if I had, like, one little nugget, like, it would just be, like, you know, we, like, we talk, I think Ralph Vito talks a lot about how, you know, an actor is training to have maximum corporeal presence. So that means you train your voice, it means you train your body, you train your thought, you train your, your concentration, all of that stuff. The idea is you want to be, like, as, as maximally present as possible in all possible ways um, in the room. And so I think that a simple way, you know, because, like, you know, pre-training, I didn't have all of the, um, the voice and speech stuff, I didn't have the movement stuff, I didn't have all of the other stuff, but what you can, you can really train is your concentration. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just really think, like, okay, like, I'm just going to, um, to stay present in this room and, and put in what people are asking me to do. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I was saying. Wow. All right, that's the end. That's perfect. That's all we needed to hear. <laughs> No, that's awesome. That's a huge tip. Um, and, you know, uh, was it me that gave you that advice when you were there? No, I'm just I wish. Kidding. I wish. No, it was, um, it was Liza, actually. Oh, cool. Liza, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. And Shalita, too. The two of them together. They're, one of them was, like, upstairs, and the other one was downstairs, like, you know, actually like, opening the door for you. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so tell me, when you auditioned for Juilliard after you trained at Bard, did you audition for any other programs besides Juilliard? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, just to clarify. So I went to Barnard, not the so Bard. Is a, I'm sorry. Is a college of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Barnard is, the, is in New York City. It's the Women's College of Columbia. Yeah, and Bar- Bard is a really awesome. That is uh, my fault. A very like liberal arts college up in upstate New York, I believe. Um, but anyway, yeah, the different different schools. But um, yeah, so I applied to let's see, I, I kind of did like the grad school circuit. So I applied to NYU. I did ACT. I did Yale School of Drama. I did a program called NTC, which doesn't exist anymore um, in Denver. And um, and then UC San Diego. Those were really cool. Like, those yeah, are all yeah, still yeah. really good. Obviously, with the exception of yeah. NTC, like those are still the graduate conservatory circuit right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was that was really that was good. And I um yeah, so I ended up getting um, called back at pretty much everywhere. <laughs> um, and then Juilliard was the only one I actually got into. Oh, cool. So uh, yeah, yeah. So it was really. Um, yeah, it was really uh, kind of an easy choice. I remember talking with one of my, my um, friends, Caitlin Harity, who had gotten into Yale and Juilliard, and it almost was just like, it was such a relief to not have to make a decision like that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, like, like which one? Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, this is this is where it's meant to be, and this is what's happening, and this is what I'm doing, and, you know, in, in at some point, inevitably, in the training, you will feel like, ah, I've made the wrong decision, everything's wrong, and I won't have a sense of, I should have on to Yale. <laughs> you will not so. run into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, very cool. That's it's, I love the story. I love it. Um, so tell us a little bit about like before you auditioned. Let's talk about your mindset. Let's talk about what pieces uh-huh. you had and how you found those pieces. Like right now it's September. Um, yeah. And, 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 and people are looking for monologues right now. Some monologues they might have found maybe they're still looking um all different types of people different cultures of young actors right now are looking at different pieces so it's like what resources can they use to find monologues where did you find yours um and then what do you you know and i do want to know which monologues you did sure yeah so i mean i think this is a really really personal process um i think uh Finding, I think finding good material that you really connect with and that shows you off is actually one of the hardest things an actor has to do. And um, and really, the, the best, so I did work with a monologue coach. I worked with someone named, a woman named Vivian Benish, um, who was recommended to me by, by Becky Guy. Uh, and she, she was fantastic. And she was a really good sounding board. Like, I would bring in material, and she would sort of help me figure out whether or not it was actually showing me off in, in the best way possible. But 
the the burden of really finding material that that was right for me was was really on me, um, and that I. I kind of kept a notebook for many years. Someone had like suggested I do this, and I can't recommend this enough. Of, um, of like, whenever you see a play, or maybe you're in English class and you're reading like Shakespeare, you know, play or sonnet, even or whatever it is, and there's anything, or like even a movie. Like if you're watching a movie and you see, there's some something that you connect with. Something like something like someone's doing something, and you're watching it, and you're and you're just like, wow, like I am really inspired by this, and I feel a really personal connection to the material, just like keep, like write down the name <laughs> of, the, of the book and the playwright yeah. or, you know, what it is, and just like keep like an ongoing list so that um, you can, when, when it comes time to really like, you know, decide, um, you kind of have some places to start. And um, so, so I think that that's really important. And um, I, yeah, so I, I also think that what's super important for me and, like, a major difference between the first time I applied versus the second time I applied is the first time I think I was trying to... I picked material that was, like, trying to be a little different. <laughs> you know, like I, like, I did, like, my Shakespeare was Joan Locke's Cell from Henry VI, and then I did, for my contemporary, I did um, this uh, a piece from this play called... This Irish play called The Weir by Connor McPherson. For sure. Lovely, lovely. Um, and... And I, uh, the problem is that I don't think I was, like, personally connected to either of those two things. And, like, yes, I could do them. And they could show me off and I could show that I'm charismatic and I, can, I know how to make a choice. I know how to come in there and sort of, like, be clear about what I'm doing and really go after something. But it wasn't personal. <laughs> and, um, and I think that, and so the second time, um, what did I do? I'm trying to actually, oh, goodness, what did I do with my, oh, yeah, my, my Shakespeare was actually from um, All's Well That Ends Well. It was Helena. And then, and then the thing that really got me, because they actually, in, their, in the callback, they asked you to please, like, come back with, a, with one of the monologues um, that you had done. And the one that they asked you to come back with was from this play called Anne of a Thousand Days by Maxwell Anderson, which is actually in, um, in verse. It's not in iambic pentameter, but it is in verse. But I actually did not have a contemporary monologue <laughs> that I did. And but the thing about Anne of a Thousand Days is, like, I was just so connected to it. It was so me. It was so, and you know, and, and like I remember speaking with Vivian about this, about like, well, I need to do Shakespeare. So I need to show them that I can handle Shakespeare. And this isn't full on, um, you know, I am a contemporary, but it is kind of this this, this verse, and it is it's a kind of poetry. And but the, the fact that I am so personally connected to this just overrides. At like pretty much every other decision about like oh is this the right type is this like should I be is this you know too done is it too like it's sort of like I remember Ralph Zito talking about how you know if Juliet is what you want is what you are most apt into then that is what you should do <laughs> and you should not worry about the fact that other people are probably doing that monologue too and you shouldn't worry about trying to be too unique the the, one, the main thing that you should be worrying about is what are you personally connected to and how, can, how is that going to show you off? Yes, I, we know that's exactly it. That's the main message that uh, we share with our audience, which is, guys, it's not about the monologue. It's about your relationship to the monologue. And, yeah. like, you know, I felt the same way about my pieces when I auditioned. Um, and, you know, they just feel that. There's something intangible. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a well-known piece or a not well-known piece. It doesn't matter if it's from a, you know, play or a novel or whatever. Um, you know, obviously there's some good old guidelines. Um, and if you are able to do, you know, with, within those guidelines, great. But like you, you know, you're doing not a contemporary monologue. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like... Look, we, we want to work with her. We're able to see her passion. We're able to see her fire. Yeah. We're able to see her artistic, like, she's putting her artistic stamp here, and we want to explore more of that. You know, so yeah. um, that's really, really enlightening, and I'm glad you shared that. So that's really cool. Have a, so, so one of my classmates, um, Virginia Vale, actually, she, uh, she didn't do any Shakespeare in her callback. Oh, no, sorry, in her audition at all, um, because she just she had, like, another verse piece that she really felt connected to that wasn't, it was not, it was more like blank verse or something, it wasn't, um, it didn't have the poetry, the feeling of poetry that, that Shakespeare, you know, has, which was just, what, you know, what you're trying to show you can handle, um, and so, you know, that's an example of someone just saying, like, I know they said this, <laughs> the rules. But here's this other thing that I'm just so fired up about and I feel so connected to and I'm just going to go ahead and do that. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's just like anything with art. It's like, 
you can break the rules as long as it's a choice. Yeah. You know, and I would not encourage anyone to not bring in a contemporary or not, you know, all that stuff. I think yeah. you need to have a Shakespeare for sure. But, you know, it is valuable to hear stories of people who got accepted and everything who, because they were so fired up about their piece, they could not deny that. And I think that that's yeah. totally, totally valid. Um, yeah. Also, just to be clear, so I think they they asked you there's going to be two, like, Two like a you know a contemporary and a Shakespeare that was contrasting that would be sort of like your two main pieces, and then they asked you to have the like two other pieces sort of an off back burner. And I definitely like had had things that were contemporary on the back burner that if they had said, hey, can you, like can you actually do you have anything that like that's like this, I would have been able to pull that out, no problem. It's just that they didn't. They were just so you know they didn't. And they never asked me to see my my secondary pieces. So. They saw everything they needed, Gabby. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Yeah. I have a question that's unrelated. Yeah. Um, a huge question that uh, we get every time we speak with classrooms and, 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 and folks is scholarships. This, yeah. is, this is probably a huge uh, sort of unspoken concern or you know, desire to understand where they can get scholarships um, or how do they get scholarships? Um, do you have any insight on that? I know that's kind of maybe not on the topic of monologues and drama school and acting. So if you don't, that's totally okay. But I thought I'd bring it up in just in case, you know, you have sure. any thoughts on where could I get scholarships? How do I, you know, get more money for college? Yeah, yeah. So in terms of like outside scholarships that are not cut through the school that you are applying to, I really don't know. I know that that exists. Um, and I don't know that much about it. Um, so, I, I mean, I was really lucky in that uh, when I applied, I, I forget if it's before I applied or after or how that works, but I was able to get scholarships directly through Juilliard. Um, and I know that that, and now that they have the whole MFA program, I, I think a lot of that has, has, has become much easier, but I, I really actually do not quote me on that because I, I, I'm not, I don't know. I know that what happened with me was um, I, I was accepted and then we had a big, a lot of back and forth about um, scholarship stuff and I got, um, I was able through Juilliard to get a very significant portion of my tuition um, covered by scholarship, but, I, but not completely. Um, so I definitely, you know, d uh, there was money out of pocket, and it, it definitely was an expense. Um, but yeah, so that's the extent of, of what I know. Okay, Sorry, great. Yeah, and that's similar to a lot yeah. of other. Yeah, that's similar to a lot of other stories um, as well, where it's like, and I think the colleges are being more transparent about that on their websites and in their financial aid um, mm -hmm. representatives, where they're like, look. The main thing you need to do is go for it. You need to apply here, and we will work it out for you. If you know we uh, we we some some of our students have fifty to eighty percent or more of their tuition covered. If you know if there's a serious need or whatever, and if there's demonstrated need, so and you know like Brandon yeah. Gill um, got a significant amount covered. I think one of those eighty percenters or more, um, and stuff like that. So it, it really um, is about not only your merit, artistic merit, but also your demonstration of financial need. So I think a good message for where to get scholarships as far as the school goes is, you know, the school can provide oftentimes a lot um, more than you think. And then it's on you. You know, it's, it's, it's like find those, you know, there's the famous app called Scholly. And I know maybe Gavi doesn't know this because this is a recent app, but it's a it's called Scholly. And it's got a ton of uh, scholarships uh, for different types of people going to college. You can get little things like that. Obviously, competitions like monologue competitions or whatever, because, um, you know, um, there's different ways to get that. So I just know that that's a burning question. And um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Let's talk about the actual audition room. Let's talk about walking in the room. Like, tell us what um, you did. What did they ask you to do? I want to hear about the initial audition first and then how you felt after that before you found out you were called back. And then uh, I want to find out about the callback. So can you walk us through, like, when you opened the door when you walked in? Yeah. So, okay, oh, but someone else I think opened this. Well, what's really awesome about Juilliard specifically is that they actually do, and maybe their audition process has changed, but at least when I was auditioning, um, 
they actually do like a group, a morning session and an afternoon session, and they in each session, um, like they do a group warm up. That's actually really helpful, <laughs> and I like highly recommend making sure you are there for that warm up. Um, uh, and um, and then and then you're kind of just hanging out, you know, because your actual appointment is only probably like you know I don't know two minutes or maybe maybe a little longer, but it's really quick. But you are sort of just hanging out with other people auditioning, and then other students. Um, who are there, and there's, that might seem intimidating, but I, I can tell you that it's actually really relaxing <laughs> and really helpful to kind of like realize that you're all in the same boat and that the culture at Juilliard is really one of support and, and that they, they want to create circumstances for you to do your best work possible. Um, they're not trying to intimidate you. I felt like at a lot of other schools, actually there, there was a lot of it, like on-purpose intimidation that wasn't super great and they certainly didn't warm you up and they didn't sort of take the time to really care, you know, take treat you with care from the beginning. That only happened once you were called back. Um, so at Juilliard, though, but yeah, so, so I already was in a pretty good state, headspace because of this warm up and because of, you know, having been hanging out there for a while and not feeling rushed, you know, getting there and then suddenly having to go in the room or, you know, anything like that. So the door, someone else, like, opened the door for me. It was, I think, a student um, and, and it introduced me to the, there were three people um, on the channel. And um, it's a pretty big room um, that has, like, a like Marley dance floor, you know, uh, on, on the floor. And um, I think there was a line, like, a piece of soup or something that, you know, you didn't go in front of. So that way you kind of were far enough back um, so that the, the people could really see you properly. Um, I'm pretty sure they made a thing about, you know, you're not going to, we're not, we, you don't shake hands or anything like that because it's cold season and they can't do, like, you know, germs and they just can't shake at their own hand. Um, and, you know, so you walk in the room, I walked in the room and... Someone else introduced me, and, um, you know, and then I said what pieces I was doing, uh, and then, you know, I, I started. And the first time, I mean, the first audition I did, um, I started the Shakespeare, and I actually just went up on the line, like, part of the You <laughs> so forgot your lines? totally forgot my line, yeah. And so I just sort of asked, like, can I start over? And they were like, yeah. And um, so I started over, and and then I, I you know I got to the, I remember getting to that same part where I like had forgotten my line, and um, and then just like muscling through. <laughs> um, <laughs> so and then you know they like they worked with me a little bit. Um, I think I sang like they asked me to sing a song, and um, you know and then and then I and then okay then I was and then that was done, and I remember thinking like oh no like you know I messed up I I forgot I forgot my line like I, you know this is bad, and then you know you're waiting and then they put up a list you know, saying, like, these are people who are called back, and I was on it, and it just, like, it didn't matter. <laughs> like, That's you know, so like, awesome. The details of, like, you know, of, like do, you know, obviously you need to memorize your, your pieces, but, like, you know, if something goes a little wrong or like, is unplanned, it's all about how you handle it in the room. How do you take care of yourself? How do you get back <laughs> on track? How do you, you know, reinvest in what you're doing <laughs> as opposed to getting, like, in your head about something? So, um but yeah, so, the, so that, that's what happened the first time, and then, um, and then the second time, it was a really similar thing, um, and, um, and uh, yeah, I don't actually remember any, like, major differences other than, so, so the, the major difference was in the callback um, between the first year and the second year was that I really made a point going into that callback the second time. I had this, I had this real feeling that, like, I, it was my response, like, but I really felt deeply down that Juilliard had made a mistake by not accepting me the first year, and that it was my responsibility to go in, go in the room, and show them that they had made that mistake, show them why. <laughs> and, Dang. You know, and the way I was going to do that was by staying unbelievably present, and um, and, re- and but, you know, and not just, not, I mean, you can't like muscle present, like you know, it's, it's a it's a hard thing. Like you have to stay present, but uh, but it's the same sort of aware, but also open to change, to changing, you know, what you're doing and, and really receiving what's going on and let it, let, you know, a suggestion that someone makes or an adjustment or something really sort of like move through you um, in a way that will show them that, you know, you, you can really change and they can work with you. So, um, so yeah, I remember in the callback for the second time, um, actually, so Richard Feldman, I mean, I and mean, he said later on, he told me this is what got me into the, the school, was, um, he gave me, like, an exercise. So I had sung a song from Oklahoma as my, like, song to sing from acapella. And he was like, okay, can you do a one-woman show of the entire, like, uh, show of Oklahoma? <laughs> and I remember... You're like, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, I, he gave me that, that like, you know, I, that was not my, my inner reaction was, oh, my God, 
do this? How am I going to do this? And I couldn't even remember, like, the whole story. Cause it was, you know, like, I, I had done the song because I liked it, but I hadn't really, like, done all the text work on, the, on, like, this musical that I was just sort of using as a tool to sing instead of, um, you know, I'd done that on my, the plays I'd been chosen my monologue from, but not on this. And so um, I think I even said, like, oh, wow, like, I hope I get the plot right. And they just sort of laughed. And, um, and I just kind of went for it. Like, I just, like, full abandon. Like, I, you know, it was, I really, I was terrified, but I was also like, this is it. <laughs> you know, and I, I have to do this. And I just, I just, like, you know, no regrets. Like, every, leave everything in the room. You know what I mean? Like, 100% go for it. And, um, and they were laughing and apparent, and then, you know, and it went really well. And afterwards, I, I didn't, after I left that room, I, in the moment, I, I mean, I remember feeling like, oh, I have no idea. Like, that, like, that, like, it was, like, it was, I just was on such an adrenaline high, you know, I, just, I didn't really know like, what, how it <laughs> You just did an interpretation of Oklahoma for Juilliard. Yes, yes, a one-woman interpretation. One-woman you know, woman interpretation of Oklahoma. Yeah. That is the first I've ever heard. I love that. Yeah, yeah, and, and so it was, and yeah, it was, definitely wasn't until way later, I was already in the program, that Richard was like, just so you know, that's what got you into the program, was that, that interpretation. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, you know, I think that, you know, not just that, but like, it's the willingness to do it. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. Like they asked me to, uh, you know, do the monologue, but in a totally different environment. They asked me to do it at uh, my father's grave. You know, oh, wow. which okay. doesn't have anything to do with the piece. Well, it does have something to do with the piece, and it was a great direction. But like, it, it's not where the piece is set or anything. So if I was you know, at all hesitant about that, they probably would have been like, you know, what the heck? But like, I was 100% game for what they were giving me. I was present and exploring it as I was doing it, you yeah. know, and yeah. it, it got yeah. me emotional. Like, you know, it was, it was super fun to take that direction. And I think that when uh, students go like, well, you know, like they have something to say about it or like, I don't know if that would really make sense or something like this. You know, that's where it's like, you, you know, you might not be ready for training. You know, you might not be receptive or open to really working with your imagination, going outside the box and playing full out, like you said. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's just, you demonstrated that so, uh, you know, beautifully. So that's cool to hear. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely think there's, they kind of, you know, there's something about the timing for training being right. Like, you, it needs to be ready. What you said about about someone might not be in a place or ready for training, like, I think that's so spot on. But it's, it's part of, like, you know, it's kind of a blessing in disguise that I didn't get in the first time. But I don't think I, I was in the right place for it, actually. Um, and it kind of, I needed another year to really get clear about what I wanted and why I wanted to go there and what I wanted out of the experience and what I felt like I needed to show them. Um, and that was... So yeah, I think the being in the right place, the right moment for training is, is very, very key. So cool. Well, look, yeah. this has been phenomenal. I want to ask if there's any other wisdom or tips or closing thoughts that you have. I think that you've just li- literally given so much value. Your story is super unique. I loved hearing about it, and I know everyone else did too. Um, you know, knowing where they're at, knowing where people are at right now, really rehearsing their pieces, finding their pieces, getting into the mindset and getting ready to go travel to these schools to audition. Um, what's, what's one thing you would share with them to keep in mind? I mean, I think, you know, just stay true to yourself. And I mean, I know that's like a sort of a, I don't know, broad thing to say, but, but, um, I think my mom said something to me, I remember right before I went into the audition process, um, but I just somehow found really helpful, and she, she just said, because I remember thinking, like, oh, this is, there's no way I'm going to get in, except, like, you know, so many, so few people, and look at all, you know, thousands of people are auditioning, and, like, you know, how is this, how am I going to ever get into this school? And my mom was just like, you know, it's a blessing to have something that you want, really, that, like, that badly. And, and regardless of whether or not you get in, the fact that you you are clear in this like extreme desire to go and seek training is just a really really beautiful thing because a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people are like, I don't know what I want or what to do. I don't have any passion. <laughs> and um, and to, and to be sort of 
like to have this passion and whether or not it ends up in going to drama school, whether it ends up just going straight into the industry or just, you know, doing something else entirely or, or maybe you'll go to drama school in a couple of years or whatever it is, like, it's just such a blessing. And, um, and that, I think you can really hold on to that and know that, that that's something really special and awesome about you um, going into those rooms. Man, yeah. <laughs> yes. All right, that is super awesome note to, like, put a button on this beautiful conversation. Thank you very much, Gavi, and I hope we either do another podcast together, maybe you can be a guest on our YouTube live session so people can actually, like, see you and ask you questions in real time or write a blog. You know, it's just awesome. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. All right. All right.